Fireside Chat Episode 9, Go Flames Go, for the long term. Recorded March 19th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Welcome back, guys. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. How you doing? Good. Healthy. Good. Matt. Matt's here, and Lucas is back with us this week. He's healthy after his uh, injury, so we took him off the IR. Upper body. Upper body. Undisclosed upper body injury. It wasn't a concussion. Good. We don't want you to get concussed. You'll start talking about stuff from previous episodes again. Oh, foreshadowing. You see what that is, kids? Watch, watch. Set me up, Dan. Last week at the beginning of the show, well, part, near the beginning of the show, Matt and I had talked about the Flames getting in and the fact that, you know, even if somehow the hockey gods shine down on the Flames this year and they manage to sneak into an eighth place spot, there's no way they're beating the Hawks. I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. So Lucas has been doing his research while he was sick and has come up with some interesting data about Cinderella teams. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Cinderella teams, if you want to go back and start just with this uh, millennia, uh, we've got the Carolina Hurricanes, the Anaheim Ducks, or Mighty Ducks of Anaheim at the time, uh, the Calgary Flames, Edmonton Oilers, and then we go on a bit of a hiatus of Cinderella teams, and then you've got a run of Philadelphia and uh, Montreal in the same year. I mean, I, and I'd consider the Canadians a, a Cinderella team just because of the way they absolutely rope a their way to the conference final. And then finally, if you really wanted to consider the LA Kings a Cinderella team with an eight seed, as an eight seed, then, you know, so be it. Those are your, you know, uh, your unexpected uh, contenders in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And oddly enough, almost, uh, if I'm, okay, two of them, only two of them are from the Eastern Conference, which, uh, I don't know, maybe it speaks to the resiliency of of those out West. But if you look at the uh, Cinderella teams, first and foremost, uh, are tight defensively, whether it's the Hurricanes, who were a team of uh, veterans on their last legs, like Ron Francis was their leading scorer, 77 points at 38 years of age. And, you know, from there you've got Kapanen, oh, Jeff O'Neill, Rod Brindamore. Uh, th- there's there's not a lot. There, there's not a lot on the Carolina Hurricanes of 2002 that suggests this is a championship caliber team, except I'm sure uh, a very tight defensive structure that was allowed to flourish in the dead puck era. And did of the Calgary Flames. The Calgary Flames, out of all the Cinderella teams, are actually the most frighteningly mediocre. I mean, Jerome McGinley, uh, 73 points, led the team in scoring with 41 goals. Um, <coughs> the next leading scorer was Craig Conroy, who had 47 points. Then 42 uh, for Donovan, Jelena with 35. Uh, and it goes on the, down the list of just... And if I remember correctly, I mean, that year the Flames ran, especially in the playoffs, uh, half that team was farm call-ups. They definitely had a lot of, uh, you know, non-NHL roster players making contributions. But the interesting thing about the Flames and Cinderella run was that almost everyone on the team who got significant playing time scored at least once. Uh, The only players I can see who didn't score goals, uh, Jordan Leopold, no goals, 10 assists. Uh, Lidman only played in six games, but uh, he had... uh, one assist. Uh, Kobasu didn't do anything. Uh, neither did Warner or Ferentz offensively, anyway. Uh, but other than that, like, Christoph Oliwa had two goals. Wow. You think of it, like, Were that, those the only two goals of the man's career? No, he had... Oh, God, there was one game against the Oilers, I think, where he scored two goals. And everyone was like, oh, my God, can you imagine if Christoph Oliwa could also play? And then that, of course, was... You know, a short-lived fantasy. But, okay, so to 
go back to what makes these teams, Cinderella teams, successful, usually it's a defensive system and, and a goalie, which even the Carolina, the Archers Urbay-led Carolina Hurricanes had that sort of. And actually, if I look at their uh, goaltending roster in the playoffs, uh, Archers Urbay. Yeah, that yeah, that was the year Urbay. Yeah, Kevin Weeks and Urbe bounced back and forth whenever they would be. Whoever was hot, that's who started. Yeah, Urbe, wow. Urbe played 18 games, Weeks played 8. Uh, but if you look at, say, the Edmonton Oilers, Edmonton Oilers, admittedly coming out of a, an inflated point production lockout, had five players with more than 50 points, and they had a 30-year-old Chris Pronger at his peak. And that's the second key. You need a franchise player in their prime. And you see that with... And who is their netminder? Dwayne Rollison. The angry... Not who I'd call a top netminder. Yeah, but, but Dwayne Rollison... At the time he was, though. Yeah. At, he was practically unbeatable for the Oilers, though. And and if Marc-Andre Bergeron didn't throw Andrew Ladd into Dwayne Rollison's knee, then, you know, they pushed them to Game 7 with UC Markin, and I don't see why Dwayne Rollison doesn't carry them to a to some sort of victory. Do you guys remember how bad Rollison was when he was a flame? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, you could play that game with everybody. It's just funny to look back and see how good he was at a time for the Oilers, for uh, uh, Tampa Bay when he played there. He's pretty good. Rollison's been a, Rollison is an underrated goalie. He really is. I remember, honestly, I saw him play uh, a playoff game uh, at Harbor Station in St. John, New Brunswick against the Fredericton Canadians. I, had, I couldn't have been more than six or seven years old. And Dwayne Rollison just took uh, Canadians prospect Patrick Lebrecht to school. And I, I remember being mesmerized by Rollison because he was the fastest skating goalie I'd ever seen at the time. Very impressive. Wow. Yeah, I know. Cool story, bro. Uh, so, defensive structure, uh, franchise player, and again, goalie, which you've got with Kiprasov, Jaguar, Rolison, not so much with the Flyers in uh, with uh, Michael Layton, but then you had Chris Pronger in the playoffs for them. So that uh, Chris Pronger is basically a, a a key function for anyone with Stanley Cup aspirations, uh, and the Montreal Canadiens. That that may have been the second worst team to make it to the third round this side of the uh, of of the Flames uh, of '04. Just that that team was nothing but get outshot, outchanced, out everything night after night, uh, and have Hal Gill block ten shots. Yaroslav Alak's gonna stand on his head, and Mike Camilleri is gonna score an opportunistic goal. Um, with all that said, then if you want to actually go to the Los Angeles Kings, then you've got uh, Anze Kopitar, Justin Williams, Dustin Brown, Mike Richards, Drew Doughty are your top five scorers. And although they underperformed in the regular season, that is a you know a Stanley Cup core that's two top six centers, uh, number one defensemen, all of whom are under the age of thirty. The oldest of whom, Justin Williams, was only twenty nine. And uh, Brown and Richards were 26, Kopitar 24, Dowdy 21. Like, that right there. Jonathan Quick uh, as well. Uh, is, is my point kind of taking shape a little bit here? Yeah. The, I think so, yeah. The Flames definitely, you know, in comparison, like all their best scores are over the age of 29. If you go with Bo Meester or Aginla, Tange, Glenn Cross, Stempniak, Camilleri, like they're all over 29, so it's not the same animal. Mm-hmm. And it's just the, the, the talent, the, not, which is nothing to, against these guys as players, but it's just relying on them to carry you into a long playoff run, especially in the absence of a rigid defensive system. Uh, is is an impossibility, I would think. I mean, honestly, I, I could understand the win and anything gets anything can happen mentality while under Brent Sutter because for all their team's flaws, uh, 
when th- there were stretches when they could play some absolute, you know, lockdown defensive hockey. Uh, and in that situation in the playoffs, anything can happen. But this sort yeah, of... Well, another thing to consider with the teams of a like, from last year and before, is that they had a lot more depth in terms of talent that this team doesn't really have. Like, if you look at the offensive production, the, you have most of the production centered in nine players, and then, like, it's a huge drop-off from Matt Stajan, who has 17 points, down to Roman Trevenka, who has eight. Like, you know... It's with, uh, but that's to, also why this team is in the position they're in. Yeah. I mean, if we had guys that were producing, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be talking about you know who we're going to face in the postseason. Yeah, true. Mm-hmm. But you know, and Lucas, before you uh, go on there, I know you're talking about you know guys over the age of thirty, and this is the biggest thing I'm hearing in this city right now from fans is we've got to trade away all the guys over thirty, and you have to have guys over thirty on your team. You can't have a whole team of guys who aren't even you know thirty years old yet. So we have to have some vets, but it's about finding that balance. Yeah, like uh, with the incoming trade deadline, the. You know, some of the sentiment out there is, like, trade off everybody that's doing good and, like, maximize the picks, but that doesn't realistically make any sense. Like, it's okay to trade off a couple of players to rebuild, but you still need some secondary players, like, say, like, Tangay or Glencross to help, you know, transition from the current team into like next year's team and beyond no absolutely like you can't have uh you know you you can't force all the pressure on your young kids no matter how good they're gonna be um now you can put them in a situation where like uh say in pittsburgh um when crosby first came up they didn't necessarily uh they didn't slot him in as the number one right away. They, he he took that on his own, uh, but and and asserted himself. And you know they gave him an A, but a prob they probably gave him an A because, you know, it was recognized that he was one of the leaders in the room. And if that happens, that's great. But you can't force that before it happens, which, as we're seeing in Edmonton, uh, can be problematic. True. Anything else you want to talk about about Cinderella teams? No, I, I, not really. Just uh, you know, just wanted to make the point that uh, well, yes, when you if you get in, anything can happen. Um, there are certain things that need to be in place for that to take place. True. Well, and I think you know those things need to be in to even have a chance to get to eighth. Yeah, you know, exactly. You're not even going to get to eighth if you don't have enough of those things. So it makes sense you would need those to go any further than that as well. Well spoken. Lately we've been talking about uh, the Oilers and what they've been doing, and I think that's been a model for a lot of people around the league as far as what the Flames need to do. But if you look at their rebuild and the Blue Jackets and the Islanders, they've all gone on kind of an aggressive rebuild lately. And has it done them any good? I think that's arguable. I'd look at them and say, you know, the Oilers have tried it, and they're still not where they want to be. The Blue Jackets definitely aren't where they want to be. The Islanders aren't where they want to be. So what do the Flames have to do differently in rebuilding their teams that those other guys haven't done to actually get some success and benefit out of their rebuild? Well, if you look at the teams that were successful, like Chicago, Pittsburgh, uh, they drafted goaltenders and defensemen first before, like, they actually started the rebuild. Like, if you look at the Penguins, they added Marc-Andre Fleury, Brooks Orpik, and uh, Ryan Whitney a year or two prior to getting Malkin and Crosby and all the rest of their players. And, like, I think they got Latang before as well. So, you know, like, they need a little bit of lead time because defensemen and goaltenders take a little longer to develop. 
And, like, if you look at Chicago, they were running Keith and Seabrook out there for, like, two or three years before even Taze or Kane were drafted. So, if you look at the Flames, they've got Gillies on the far, or in the college ranks and a couple other prospects. And you got TJ Brody, who's really coming into his own this year. Whereas, you look at the Islanders, they're top defenseman is Mark Streit, and, like, that's it. The rest of them are just kind of wishy-washy. And they've... No. And, you know, like, you go through all those teams, like Columbus, they're... They've never really had any good defensive draft picks. And they keep trying to draft forwards from Philatov, you know, on and on and on. And that doesn't necessarily, you know, you need the your back end being set prior to trying to pencil in some forwards. And we talked last week about the defense and the uh, goalies who are in this system. And I think you and I, when we were doing the show without Lucas last week, pretty much came to the conclusion that while the Flames don't have any stars... They're not in a bad position there. They've got some guys that could really develop and become good NHLers, at least on the blue line. Um, I think this team's putting their hopes and net on Kerry Ramo for the future. So do you think they've done enough there, Matt, based on what you're saying, to be in that position that now they can start taking forwards and start a rebuild process like the teams well, that have been successful? They still don't have quite enough defensemen. And, like, that's why I think it's important if they uh, do decide to rebuild to either get some good defensive prospects in the trade or uh, look at drafting defensemen in the with the draft picks to just keep adding to that. But, you know, they, they have a good start. It's just this the follow-up moves, you know, it, that'll be... It just as important. Yeah, the the flames again. I, I agree with Matt that the uh, it, it's a good start. Uh, Patrick Sealoff, Tyler Witherspoon, uh, even players like uh, Ryan Culkin and Brett Kulak. Uh, you know who are who both project to be like Brody types. Uh, that's a good solid prospect base. But uh, I mean, like going back to what you said, Dan. Like Chicago had. Uh, Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook playing minutes in the NHL a, a good two years before they even acquired Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane. And right now the Flames have graduated one defensive prospect since Mark Giordano, and that's TJ Brody. Um, now, if all of if you know after the deadline we see say Chris Breen recalled and he doesn't look out of place. And uh, other players, you know, sort of assert themselves. Then we can say that they might be a bit on a bit of a, you know, on the right track to building their blue line. But so many of these prospects. I mean, we like to talk about Jankowski being far away, but there's a ton of players in the system that, while they could be talented are probably at least two years away from making any discernible impact in the NHL. So you're thinking that the Flames might have to um, live... F- f- the Flames organization the Flames fans might have to live through two or three years of getting those guys ready before we can do anything significant. One of the things that uh, might make sense for the Flames is if they do trade off some of their higher ticket guys like Bo Meester, Ginla, and Camilleri, they might be able to get some decent secondary guys in the free agent market, like a Bozak or a Stahlberg, Philpula, those types, and like just run several lines of more second-line players while you're waiting for guys like Berchi, Gaudreau, Jankowski, etc. to actually assert themselves. So you're not completely terrible, but, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, um, you, you, there's definitely, there needs to be some sort of stopgap in place. The pro, I mean, the problem is, especially with free agents, you're going to need to overpay to get guys to come in to be stopgaps. Because, 
as much as we would look at other, you know, the aforementioned Oilers, Islanders, and Blue Jackets, um, and say that things aren't necessarily going the way they'd want them to, there's a whole lot more reason to come to any of those teams as a free agent than there is to Calgary, outside of a massive overpayment. Or, or at least some significant, which doesn't quite... Yeah, well, like, if you, if you look at, like, what the Panthers did prior to last year, that's exactly what they did, is they outspent everybody on those players, and they got four or five, six, seven free agents to actually join them, and they did succeed, albeit just for the one year. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that it's an option. That, that was a weird situation, though, where Florida had to spend all that money just to get to the salary floor. I mean, it, 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 all things being equal, I don't think they wanted to go out and take on Brian Campbell's contract, give Scotty Upshaw whatever they gave him, $14 million. Uh, you know, th- yes, they put an entertaining team together, but I, I see what you're saying. I, I, it's going to be weird or difficult for the Flames to even get to be in that position just because th- they're... They've been a cap team, and it's not easy to get that much salary flexibility to do a sort of Panthers spending spree. Yeah, and like that would only be possible if they did trade off some of the bigger ticket guys. Mm-hmm. So, let's play armchair GM for a second. I want to hear what your guys' opinion is. So, I think there's two ways the Flames can go if they start trading names like Bowmeister, names like Camilleri, big contract guys they could either trade them for draft picks and take their chances on the draft floor or they could trade them for established young players like i'm thinking you know you could get an ian cole from st louis or perhaps a kevin shattenkirk which way would you guys go i'm thinking if it was me i would probably end up trading i mean if you're going to trade jerome for picks that's great but i think you need to have a a balance. We don't want to have 30, 40 picks. I mean, that's an over-exaggeration, but I wouldn't want to have 10 picks in the top two rounds. I'd rather trade for some guys that are stopgaps, that are young guys that we can hopefully fill out and work with over the next three, four years to become I, members I of this team that, that are actually productive. certain players do have to be earmarked for uh, returning You know, your guys like, say, an Ian Cole. Uh, and I would throw Giordano into this category that uh, if you can trade Giordano for a young up and coming player who, who's a roster player um, then go for it but the, the if you're moving any bigger name like a like a again like Camilleri no, I don't think Tangay's move I don't think it's you know I don't think the organization wants to move Tangay and I don't think the market's that high for him especially with yeah, um, I don't know no. what's the right move right now either. <laughs> my my thinking is that you want to avoid trading for roster players when possible when you're doing a, a rebuild, just because you are getting players, especially if they're worth anything, then they will be pr- quickly. I would imagine approaching free agency. And at which point you're not going to get them at a bargain anymore, and you're going to have to sign them to probably a little bit of an overinflated contract, and you're going to put yourself in a in a poor salary cap situation without getting the results you want, which is the situation we've been in for the last three, four years anyway, and it's getting old. And part of the value inherent to prospects is that they're unknowns and that their potential and ceiling is so you know, tantalizing, the, which is why you see a guy like Ty Ratty, whose name's bandied about in all sorts of trade proposals, but who, frankly, could just be nothing more than Ryan House all over again. I mean, you watched him at the World Juniors this year, he had on a team with uh, Jonathan Drouin, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Nathan McKinnon, like, he, and Nathan McKinnon didn't do much in the tournament either, but, and, but he didn't exactly assert himself, and... You're telling me that uh, uh, Steve Spot wouldn't have liked Ty Ratty to force his hand a bit to do something, and like that's not the sort of player you acquire in a trade. But 
It is the sort of player, if you've got a bunch of picks, that you can leverage into someone else real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, with... Like, say the Flames do trade again low. Like, I'd expect to see, like, a first-round draft pick included and a significant prospect of some sort, like... More like a Jankowski or slightly less in terms of potential. Good, but not, like, top, top end. And, like, a third or fourth line quality youngish roster player. And, yeah, you know, it's just uh, a little frustrating because you don't know exactly what's out there. Like, Say, like, uh, Ian Cole, well, maybe the Blues are really high on him and they don't want to train him. And so you're left with, you know, secondary options that aren't preferable. And, like, if the trade doesn't make sense, you don't make it. And, I don't know, it's just so hard to evaluate exactly what each one of the players should get. Yeah. The other thing I haven't heard talked about too much, but I think is perhaps worth discussing is when we're talking about the players that all the fans think the Flames have to move and what they might get back, it's always young players, it's always draft picks, it's always prospects. But I think there's a significant chance if we want to take a if we want to get a young player, a young roster player back from a team, we're going to have to eat some salary as part of the favor. So do you guys think and do you have any ideas of who we might see coming back as a salary dump None in some whatsoever. of these deals? I'm a horrible co-host for for not knowing these sort of things. But it 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 is. Uh, it's all speculation. Do you think the chance uh, oh, is there, you, though? There's a good chance yeah, we'll be you, taking you take a dump? A, you'll take salary back, but it would. Ima- I would imagine, based on league history to this point, that uh, it, it would be some sort of expiring contract or, you know, something... What, one of those secondary players that we talked about, you know, gap-bridging type players. Yeah, like, say, like, if we made a trade with Chicago, getting someone like R- Roslav Olesh back, who's, you know, okay, but he makes, like, $3 million, that, you know, he might have some potential there still, but, you know, the fact that he's on... Sh- Considering some of the bad money the Flames have spent, like the uh, code leak deals lately, I think fans would take pretty much any of those guys yeah, and like be happy if, with it. If you got like full value plus the cap dump, I don't think anybody would complain. It's just that if the cap dump itself is part of the value, then yeah, not so much. Yeah, you, you don't want to you don't want to pay to to take salary. Which, you know, we did with Buffalo. To Again, take garbage. Totally. Like that, like, that cost us a second round pick, and we got it back, but we had to trade down to do it. And, that, and then it cost us our, you know, our 14th pick. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we got the guy we wanted, allegedly, so good for us. Um, I'm just looking over at, on uh, Cap Geek here. Uh, Boston Bruins um, and anyone that uh, you know hmm. maybe the salary that we take back is Nathan Orton I don't know if he's healthy or if he's having a good year or whatever but I can't imagine that uh, a player with his injury history is necessarily going to be the uh, especially with an expiring contract if if the Bruins can just kind of pawn off his money well, in the the Bruins case, I think we'd just eat $2 million of a Gimlas contract instead because they might want Horton on the off chance that he comes back in the playoffs. Well, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got 16 points, 8 goals, 8 assists, and he's plus 2 with only 11 penalty minutes. So not a great year for him, but yeah, a guy you could still use in the postseason and you know put up some okay numbers. He, he usually puts up good postseason numbers. 
Actually, I guess he's only been to the postseason once, but yeah, he put up 17 points uh, in 2010, 2012, or 2011. We were talking about the Panthers earlier, and I'm just looking. Uh, on the 15th, they acquired TJ Brennan, a 23-year-old defenseman for a fifth-round pick, and that's the kind of thing I'd be okay with the Flames doing, is bringing in a young 23-year-old guy for you know fifth, sixth, seventh picks, or even as part of a deal, just to evaluate them, see what's going on. And I always feel like those are the kind of guys you can flip later in a package yeah, deal if they're not panning like out the way I want them to. Getting the lock on off from L.A. or uh, even... Um, the Kings getting Keaton Ellerby off of the Panthers, you just don't know. Yeah, you know, they they might be a late bloomer, and you might actually get something useful out of them for nothing. Especially for a team that's going to be trading a significant part of their core, I think, for the Flames, any young guys that might be able to step in who maybe wouldn't get an option otherwise, uh, it's a good thing to try. It's not like we're a playoff team where we don't want to put TJ those guys Brennan, in the ice. Like, what is, who is he? What makes him... Like, well, he's just. I mean, if you look at his, if you look at some of his stats, he's making five hundred fifty thousand. He's a young defenseman, um, decent and decent AHL numbers. Uh, this year, he had twenty points, fourteen goals, or no, thirty four, thirty four points, uh, twenty assists, fourteen goals in Rochester, and he's a defenseman. So, you know, a young player who's shown something, shown a spark of something there, um, and to me it's worth a shot. I mean, if you've got a 28-year-old Derek Smith on our team who's making more money, why not give the young kid a try and maybe he's got some more stain power than yeah, Derek Smith. It, it, it couldn't hurt. I'm, I'm so wary of just giving up draft picks, even fifths at this point, for, the, for this team in this situation because, you know, if you're going to, like, Patrick Holland was a fifth-round pick. And he was included in the in the Camilleri trade, and you know I, I feel like it's way easier to sell a team on a fifth round pick that's putting up big numbers in junior as opposed to a twenty something tweener defenseman who and, and you know this is a, a, this is meant this sounds like I'm slagging off T.J. Brennan I'm not uh, you know but like I I just think you know Brendan Nicholson yes we we got Blair Jones out of him a guy who apparently is just not a team player, so on a team devoid of centers, he's not. He's such a, a jackass that we don't want him around. So, I mean, I don't know. You, you can't be paralyzed by fear, but I'm, I'm so fearful of making the wrong move. <laughs> But at the same time, this team has got to try something new. I mean, if we're paralyzed by fear, this team is going to continue. They're going to re-sign Jerome for too much money, and it's going to be business as usual. So I think at this point, the Flames have to try something new to get out of their comfort zone and see what's going to work for them. Yeah, I, d I don't disagree. I mean, it's almost uh, like the Seinfeld episode, whatever, you know, whatever my natural impulse to this point has been, I will do the opposite because everything I know is wrong. Yeah, if we follow our natural impulse, we're going to have Jerome with an $8 million contract for six years or some right. crazy stuff like this that. Is, uh, this is why you can't... This is why the Patriots are a good franchise, because the Patriots don't give a damn about storybook. Um, the, the, the Flames organization, the city as a whole, has really bought into this narrative that we all want to believe, where Gindler retires a flame and rides off into the sunset... Except for the fact that the key point which makes all that possible where they win a Stanley Cup and he's a champion and then, okay, yeah, you can kind of just retire with your team in dignity. You're trying to, if you keep your own, you're trying to force a story that just doesn't exist. You're believing in a fairy tale. Well, Matt and I chatted a little bit about that last week and, you know, I said to Matt, um, even if Jerome gets traded, I'm not convinced that the last we see of Jerome in a Flames jersey, I can see him coming back here for a year or so before he retires to try and get help the fans get that storybook ending, to come back to the city that he loves because we know he likes Calgary. So I don't think that just because Jerome gets traded means he's never going to wear a Flames jersey again. I do. I think it has to be that way. Like the How many guys have gone back to teams and had it work out? Everyone you can think of, especially in recent memory, especially in the UFA rental category, 
uh, everyone who went back, their team was either no better off or, in fact, worse than when they... Yeah, I don't think Jerome might come back next year, but give it three, four years once this team has moved on, licked their wounds, gone over them, and then you bring them back not as a first-line center, but as a third- or fourth-line winger, and, uh, you know, let him just play out his but career. Why? Like, because, again, that's that's just doing it for the story. Like, if you think that a 40-year-old Jerome McGinley is going to help you in some way, like, a say, a Yarmory Yager with your Claude Giroux-type franchise player that budding franchise player that we've got, then, you know, knock yourself out. If he's the best thing available, then go for it. it but if it's just to yeah. bring back Jerome so he can have one last ride in Calgary, then that, that that's... At the same time, though, I don't know if he has to be a Yager guy. I think he could be a, you know, a Craig Conroy, a Dave Lowry, even a Steve Vajen type guy, a, you know, third, fourth line guy who's not necessarily the best, not a, the best veteran, but they're out there and they're contributing in their own way. Um, but I'm tired of contributing in their own way. Like, here's the thing. Like, Mark Recchi, when he was a Bruin, yeah, he was an old vet. He had that contribute in like an intangible sort of way, leadership, mentor, blah, blah, blah. Except Mark Recchi was still a pretty useful player. If you if you just want Jerome McGinley to, you know, be some mucker on the fourth line, then there's any number of people that we could get to do we'll that. But, you know... With, yeah. without the... and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that I don't. I don't know that this would be the end. I know that he likes this city. I know that he might want to come back. So I wouldn't count it out. I wouldn't say it's guaranteed to happen, but I wouldn't count it out. I, I just think the biggest thing you can't do is trade him and then re-sign him on July 5th because that's like, oh, we're breaking up, break up, and you're getting your you're getting your life know. together, and then oh we're back together, and then it's like oh what there's a reason this never works. If the yeah I, I'm and we we talked about this last week you weren't here but I said you know there could be a merit to doing that if the Flames can say you know we're resigning him but he's not our number one guy we're going to resign him and bring him in as the number two guy because we got a new number one guy for him. I mean the, the problem with that is just that. He, he's your number one guy, not by, you know... Legacy. Not that, not that you've... Uh, yeah, it's not by legacy. It's just that he's the best player on the team. Uh, even at 36, he's the best player on this hockey team. Yeah, and I think part of that, too... I mean, there's a... And I don't know how, how deep we want to get into it again this week, but I think a lot of that has to do with the salary he's taken in, the fact we haven't been able to get somebody else because of that salary hit, I think... Um, you know, I mean, this team in in general is not very good. I mean, you know, we have Matt Stajan is the only natural centerman. So I agree with you that he might be the best guy, but I don't think he has to be the best guy. And I do think part of it's legacy. I think it's, you know, the team just says, oh, Jerome is the guy. He's the starting right winger. He's the captain. I think if he leaves and we got a good enough package in return for him, the team might be able to say, okay, maybe now he's the number two guy because he's coming in. He's only making $3 million. It's more justifiable. But, but, but it's not a money thing. It's it's literally just it's reality. There there is who, who's a better player on the team than Aginla? Who's a better winger? Well, right now nobody. But if Aginla leaves, you're going to get something for him. So it's possible that something's coming back either through trade or through free agency that would be able but to replace nobody that. who's going to nobody who's going to come in in time for the start of se- this se- the season next year is going to, you, you, even the prospect you get is not going to be better than Jerome again at 36 years old. Jerome's only got 19 points. I, I'm pretty confident we could replace that. The thing is, is that like if we trade Jerome, I think that it would be good for the both the fan base and like everybody involved to just turn the page entirely and... Like, if you're wanting to sign someone, sign someone else just to, you know, like, as Lucas said, like, once you break up with someone, you don't want to see them. <laughs> you know, new page, new people, go with your bear cheese and whoever you get in the trade and, you know, new page entirely and not revisiting the past. Yeah, and 
And I mean, I'm with you guys, but as we've said, every time we've talked about trade, you got to do what makes sense. And to me, if there's a possibility to trade Jerome and then have him come back in the offseason because he's a good player, I think it has to be explored. I, and I just think it doesn't make sense for the long-term health of the team to bring him back. No. Because it would just it would it would be the same thing again and again, except no, because like except we traded him, so we got something for him, and now yeah, it's back. Like, so. if you trade him off, it's like opening a window and you know getting fresh air into the team because the culture will be changed, and so like you're just getting on a new page, and then you're bringing back the same guy. It's you know it. Yeah, I know what you're saying, though. I mean, you know, new captain would have to be named. There's things that could... And I'm not, you know, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing or saying this is what we should do, but I'm just saying if the possibility is there, I think it would have to be explored. If you have the chance to bring back the guy who's been that number one guy, and maybe you don't do it, but I think it would have to be something that they would talk about of, geez, he's available, he wants to come back. You always maybe consider it's right. everything, but, you know... Yeah. I- I would much rather give $5 million to Tyler Bozak than another $5, 6000000 million to Jerome McGinley. Even $4 million. I mean, if we want to talk about nostalgic acts, this city got crazy a couple years ago with the prospect of Flurry coming back. I mean, you know, we've seen crazier things in the city in the last that couple was, years. That was, though, that was sort of a phoenix rising from the ashes with, with all his personal demons. The team at the time, if, keep in mind, was coming off the summer, signing Bo Meester, having this, you know, big three of Phaneuf, Regeer, and Bo Meester, uh, looked like that was going to be enough to sort of match them up well with the Hawks. Uh, you know, Jokinen was going to be the guy that we all hoped and thought we, he was going to, you know, hoped and dreamed, number one center, all that fun stuff. Uh, and Fleury was just, you know, the icing on the cake to this tremendously exciting off season. Um, it, if Steve Beijing could make the team this year, I bet Theo could have made the team if he tried out. Oh, yeah. Under this regime, Theron Fleury would have definitely made the team. I think he plays right wing and center, doesn't he? Prob- I think he's just a winger. He played both. Okay. Um, on that subject, do you want to briefly address the uh, some of the uh, contractual dead space we've got? Uh, on the big club right now, like, is there no market to for for us to move Babchuk or Sarich or someone? Just like Anton Babchuk, since signing a five million dollar contract, has played what fifty games. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. is that. is there? I don't begrudge him, but, but why would somebody well, want to take he's that? He's a right-handed power yeah, play shot. I don't you know, know. He could probably up. like if you ate half the contract. I'm because he's done at the end of the year. Like I'm sure you could get a sixth or a seventh round pick, and like if, realistically, if you're paying him anyway, you know, if you're only paying half and you're getting something for it, I don't see why not. Well, I just he, he, I don't think he wants to be no. here. Like, well, you're not using him even in your flimsy third pairing D rotation, and frankly, it's because he doesn't deserve to be in. But yeah, and like if you can get anything for him, that's great. I honestly don't see any team really jumping for joy trying to get him. But no, neither neither do I. But I. I and I think that if I mean if we're moving out a lot of big salary, the Flames might just say we can't get rid of them. Let's just ride yeah. this out till the end of the they're, year. They're probably going to have to do that. But I mean, this is this is something that the organization really needs to do going forward. Actually, identify players who you're going to play, and if you're not going to play them, don't give them multi-year deals. Don't give them deals that are eating up two million dollars in salary cap. And it is as Again, nothing to do with Corey Sarich's abilities as a player, but it's quite obvious that uh, the team not really feeling the Corey Sarich love. Oh, I know. And like, if you look but, at players that mm-hmm. have been riding in the press box between Cervenka, Sarich, and Babchuk, like that's over eight million dollars. That's just 
parked on the sidelines. Like, that's not good roster or cap management. Like, if you look at Hoodler, like, you could go and sign two players like Hoodler for what you've got parked on the sidelines. Like, what are Mm -hmm. you doing? (laughs) And, you know, the Flames have 12 pro contracts, including their two goalies, Danny Taylor and Joey McDonald, who expire this year. So I'm wondering if the Flames are just saying, you know what, we have a bit of a mess in our hands. Let's make these trades. Let's get rid of these contracts. They're going to expire anyways. And then we'll look at, you know, reallocating those dollars. They've done a good job of acquiring players in free agency. Like, ever since Tange and Jokinen yeah. were signed, like, they've constantly done a good job. So, why not just shed all the excesses and, you know, put assets into just signing players like Hoodler and Weidman? And I feel like Feaster has done a good job of cleaning up the contract mess that Daryl Sutter left behind. I mean, we had guys make an exorbitant amount of money that didn't deserve it. And we've still got a couple, like Stage and who's overpaid, uh, Babchuk is overpaid. But it's always going to happen. But I feel like he's done a good job already to shed well, some actually, of the contract mess Stegen he got. has done rather well this year. I wouldn't actually call him overpaid. I, you know, for how he's performed, he's probably slightly underpaid. In one year, but if you look at the history of the contract... Oh, yeah, was... no, I'm not saying last year and before. Like, Bull Meester was a $4 million defenseman last year, but, you know, now he's actually earning and his pay. As much as Feaster, so. you know, the bad contracts are... I don't know, it, it's weird that an organization that does do a fairly effective job in free agency, whether it's Tangay bringing him back or Weidman or Hoodler... Uh, they, you know, they're, they're fairly efficient in free agency, except when it comes to extending their own guys. So for whatever reason, they, like they've, uh, the, like they just start gripping the stick real tight, turn it to sawdust, and then we get the Babchuk contract. We get Corey Sarich, two years, four million. Tim Jackman is another one of those healthy scratch players who just, who got a two year extension at the deadline. Why? What yeah. was what was well, the pressure? The, well, the thing is, is that it seems like sunk cost is factoring in in their decisions because, like, they gave up Ian White and uh, Brett Sutter to get Babchuk, so oh, we must keep him because of the that cost. And saving face, and, and, yeah, and like keeping Como. It's just, you know, like you should just move on and go and get somebody else. Like if the guy's not performing at 100% for you, get somebody else. Well, we know sometimes that's easier said than done when you have a contract already as well. Well, no, and like that's what I'm meaning like with re-signing players like Jackman and Como and Babchuk, like you just can let them walk. At 600000 I'm okay re-signing Jackman, but yeah, Como at uh, a million and a Love quarter, it. I wouldn't re-sign him. I think Babchuk will find another job in the NHL, but nowhere near $2.5 million. I'm league minimum or... I, I, yeah, I would be really shocked if he finds a job, just because he, he hasn't been able to crack a lineup in two years. But could he get a seventh defenseman job somewhere? Who wants that veteran seventh defenseman? I think he's gonna be more likely going back to Russia just because he'll likely and get he'll actually get more to play. There. Yeah, I'm waiting for the Serge contract to come off the books. We got two years there, but that's that was never a good contract. No, it, well, it, it, here's the thing: it is a good contract if you actually play it. If if Corey Serge is capable of giving you, you know. 85% of a Hal Gill type performance. Then it's a fine contract, but it's a horrible Yeah, if he's playing a third Yeah, if he's playing a third solid line role, that's perfectly Yeah, he's a PK fine. specialist or something. But when you're when you just don't bother dressing him, then it's I mean, I, I don't care about the money. I care about the fact that but even on the years, I mean, he's been here and he's dressed, like in 2007, 2008, he dressed for 80 games, and he didn't have a great season. 
Well, I mean, he's been here for now six years, so I mean, he, he's capable of filling some sort of role, and I think he's always been a little bit underappreciated or borderline disrespected by the by the management or coaching staff because his foot speed's not great, but he's a very useful player when you actually use him properly. He's he's a savvy guy. He's physical. He you know he doesn't panic. Um, Mm-hmm. And I think honestly, any of Sarich's, a lot of Sarich's struggles have probably been uh, compounded by playing with some inept partners, and he's not physically capable of covering their mistakes. We were talking earlier about why the Flames are paying uh, a lot of money to re-sign their own guys and to re-sign UFAs. Do you think that Calgary could now be like Edmonton and be an undesirable market for guys to come to, so there's a premium to be paid if you want them to come here? No. I The reason for Edmonton's lack of ability to sign free agents is because of the fact that Lowe and Tambellini are still there after the whole Chris Pronger debacle. And like they, I don't think they've even signed anybody that's not previously been an oiler since. So, the thing is, is that, like, the Flames have missed the playoffs the last three years, and, like, they still signed Hoodler and Weidman, so I don't see that necessarily being a big issue. I I think that this season, if it's handled poorly, if they don't show that they're capable of recognizing when they need to rebuild... That will hurt the team's prospects of wooing outside interests to the city. But I think the organization is decently respected enough, though the O'Reilly thing probably didn't help. Though that, I'm sure, uh, they'll get a mulligan for that simply because nobody else knew, despite the fact that the Canucks said they did, which I don't think anybody buys. It's easy to say anything you want after the fact. Yeah, I, I don't think it's yeah. They're they're not in Oiler territory yet. I mean, the Oilers also took took some crap for uh, with Sure. You know, they they forced him to come back from an injury or or something like that. That I remember reading that story a couple of years ago. Uh, th- th- there's you know, and and they you know they threw three kids into the fire and expected them to bring home a Stanley Cup completely without you know without any reasonable expectation that they could do so and they've, you know and of course now they've wasted the entry level contracts of two of their three stars true I think that either way whether there's a lot of trades at the deadline whether uh, Feaster decides it's time to stand pat or he just can't make the moves I think this is going to be a year of transition for the Flames with 12 contracts expiring something's got to change and so I think it'll be interesting to see over the next two weeks what goes on definitely it'll be fun i'm excited you know for better for worse we're gonna have a different face to this team and a different identity next year and i'm excited to see what this team does over the next week i think this road trip's gonna seal their fate and depending on what happens there is gonna depend how quickly the moves start getting made yep let's go i'll go flames i can't cheer for other teams i still don't want them to win but i i don't want them to lose but, I mean, Go Flames can mean many things, right? Go Flames could mean, you know, go... Yeah, Go Flames for the long term. Yeah. Go Flames for the long term. Go Flames to make the right decisions in the short term. Yeah. We're still rooting for our team, whether it's for on-ice performance or to help rebuild it and make it into the franchise that we all want yeah. it to be. Stanley Cup or bust. Yeah. yeah. And do whatever it exactly. takes to get there. It, it might be a long road, but nothing worth having comes easy, right? Exactly. All right, let's wrap this yeah. up. All right, gentlemen, well, that's it for this week. As always, we'll encourage our fans to check out firesidechat.ca for articles. Matt's been writing a lot of great articles there uh, for past episodes and future episodes of the podcast. Check us out on Twitter and Facebook. All the links are on the website. And if you have anything you want to let us know about, if you want to chat with us, if you want to disagree with us, you can either comment on the website, Facebook, or Twitter, or you can email us at feedback at firesidechat.ca. That's it for us this week, and we'll see you all next week for another episode of Fireside Chat. Suck it, Tom. Oh, we are the boys.
there's a chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. 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 Edited by Dan Stevenson.